Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Marketing Monday Wins and Fails, a show that covers all of the interesting stories in the last week in marketing and business. And this one's a doozy to start off with. I'm going to give a win to everybody in chat that likes to spam the words Yep Coke. If I were to ask you what the number one export of Colombia is, what would you tell me? Well, you're all wrong. Actually, it's oil is the number one export. That is for the next two or so months. And then it's going to be cocaine. <laughs> Cocaine is on pace to pass oil and become Colombia's number one export as a country due to incredible recent growth in the amount of coca leaves produced in the country. See, back in January, we entered what you could be called golden age of cocaine across the globe. As demand increased, people had more demand across the globe. And for a long time, the military in Colombia did a lot of measures to try and stop people from growing coca leaves in the country. Namely, they had a US sponsored thing where they would fly and put like toxins that killed all plants and fly them from planes over coca farms, which made it very hard to maintain consistent coca leaf production. But that stuff phased out starting in 2015. And since then, there's been a massive boom in farmers in Colombia starting to grow coca leaves. What happened after that is very interesting and a case study in like market dynamics, cartels and monopoly, because almost instantly the supply grew rapidly and you ended up with more coca leaf than ever before. 60% of the world's cocaine all comes from Colombia, up 24% this year. So the revenue goes up in the country. Again, if cocaine doesn't get sold, Colombia is in a disaster. <laughs> and so the supply has gone way up. Now, normally when the supply of something goes way, way up, the price goes down. But in fact, only a few powerful cartels control the ability to turn the coca leaf from cocaine in Colombia through all of the you know militaries and police of the world and border restrictions and get them into the end consumer in America in Europe. And so because they control that power, things have played out kind of differently. Now, first thing I want to tell you is extremely unique happening right now in Ecuador. So Colombia and Peru had a massive boom in cocaine production. Now, Ecuador, Ecuador is a banana producing country. They don't produce cocaine and they have one of the largest banana exporting economies. And because of that, because they produced and exported bananas for so long, they have great shipping lanes and ports. Now, because cocaine is worth much more than bananas and is blowing up in these two countries, they've suddenly basically invaded Ecuador. There is currently like a soft invasion happening of Ecuador ports, factories, banana plantations to stuff it all full of cocaine. 30% of global banana trade is in Ecuador, but it's become the perfect place to transport huge quantities of cocaine. So you, what you're seeing is like insane briberies played to Ecuadorian police. You're seeing banana plantations held at gunpoint and they're just stuffing bananas and banana crates oh, full of cocaine. And of course, the negative repercussions are immediate. Murders up, violent deaths up, crime up. The consequences are of, of Ecuador not even being part, not even having cocaine production within their country is up. You're seeing cocaine producers buy legitimate businesses in Ecuador to set up cocaine smuggling facilities. Now, first thing you're thinking is that people are, are having, they're not, they're not consuming cocaine in Ecuador or Peru or Colombia, really. In fact, the prices there are so cheap, the irony of it is you can't even give cocaine away there. The amount that it, the production has increased is insane. There's actually too much cocaine being created in these countries. People don't even want it. But America's cocaine use is mostly flat except for these states, which is DC and Vermont. <laughs> I don't know who specifically, but yes, these are where cocaine is is, is uh, increasing in America. But actually the major rise in cocaine consumption has been coming from Europe. Europe has been dramatically increased the amount of cocaine they're consuming since 2017, which coincides with this massive boom in supply. Yeah, Belgium going crazy. <laughs> But anyway, the economics are what's weird here is because it turns out like certain other industries that have sort of cartel or monopoly pricing, increases in supply that, that would normally lower cost have not been passed on to the consumer. <laughs> what you'll find is if you look at the stats, it costs $2.44 a gram of cocaine in Colombia. By the time it reaches the end user, it is $175 a gram. No matter how much prices go down, the fact that the cartels control the supply, they're just not passing along the pricing. They're just keeping the profit difference. And the reason I brought this up first, the reason I thought this was so interesting is because when you say this happens in the world of drugs, people understand that cartels are not good people. They're not gonna pass along the price increase. Nobody seems to really get it when you point out the exact same dynamic happens in any industry where a few key players control the whole supply. 
in things like groceries where, yes, sometimes there is legitimate inflation. In fact, the government has printed insane amounts of money. There is real inflation. But sometimes if you look at their profit and loss statements, their costs have not increased and yet they are still passing along increases in price. And so I set this all up. You know, I talked about cocaine and this very interesting story coming out of Columbia to set up a larger story about what's going on right now with Google, which is going to give my fail of the week. All right, let me give a fail to Google because this week is the beginning of the largest antitrust suit in tech in all of our lifetimes as the United States government has officially uh, begun a months long antitrust suit against Google for monopoly practices. I think when we do antitrust on big tech, it is uniquely polarizing for consumers because we generally like Google. Google, Google does not increase prices on us and they do their job fairly well, although the quality has gone down recently. It's interesting because there are benefits to scale with something like Google that makes the product better. And so the reason we have to be wary is because it's not that we're getting milked on prices so much. It's more of that we don't know what we could be getting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The possibility of competitors that are better on things like privacy, of competitors that are better on things like more accurate niche search results, better on things like better advertising split for videos, for creators. All those things don't exist because things are good enough now and Google entrenches their monopoly. So there's possibilities of things we could have that are better that we never see. And we are happy enough with things are now, which is how they sort of skate by. And so, so far the trial is only one weekend. Not a lot of things have happened, right? There's many more months to come. But the few, the two key things I've seen from the trial so far are one, this leaked email from the earlier days of Google when they started to get really entrenched and start paying $10 billion to Apple and, and LG and Samsung to make sure that Google was always the default and no one else could be considered. Google was ready to go. So they have made all of their senior staff take training to avoid saying, anything in an email that could show up and look bad on them later. So you can't say dominance. You can't say market share. <laughs> They have like code words for everything. They can't say scale or network effects or leverage or lockup or because, uh, you know, there's so many great quotes from previous antitrust lawsuits where they find emails where the guy's like, yeah, we're going to quash our competition <laughs> beneath our boot. <laughs> avoid metaphors involving wars or sports or winning or losing. This is all to avoid getting caught in antitrust. And they've also made all their senior staff basically use incognito chat mode, which means when they talk to each other via chat, all of the messages are self-deleted within 24 hours. And they found a very interesting email from the CEO of Google. He was like in a very, you know, disgusting thing that would be antitrust related and chimed in and said, hey, turn off chat history. <laughs> and said you have to CC our lawyers on all emails, even when they're not needed, so you can shield the contents under attorney-client privilege. So you listen, I'm not saying Google's guilty here. I'm saying they have a lot of very guilty looking behaviors. <laughs> and then the lawyer came in with a pretty cold line, said they turned the history off, Your Honor, so they could rewrite it here in this courtroom. <laughs> Which is pretty based. That's a giga chat line. So, but the reason I want to talk to you guys is because I know a lot of people when they hear stuff like this, they might support it in theory, but they're secretly thinking, I, you know, I like Gmail, I like YouTube, I like Google. And, and I do too. And so I want to say that the risks from this for the consumer are very low. And in general, being supportive of antitrust has always been good for the consumer in the end. Let's talk about that. So this article is called the Google trial is going to rewrite our future. And I want to go back through some of the antitrust trials in the past. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a big antitrust trial against AT&T, which controlled basically all the phone lines in America. And they would charge consumers insane prices for things like long distance calls between states and things like that. Anyway, the government wanted to break that up and they did. One of the last times we had a big antitrust breakup, they broke AT&T up into seven companies. They ended up becoming Verizon and Quest and CenturyLink. And listen, we already have bad enough problem with internet providers. Imagine if it was only one. But when they did this, it caused the ability for other companies to build services around phone lines easier. They couldn't do without going through AT&T before, now they could. And this created the rise of the open internet. Like people were able to use modems, to like home modems to connect online and tons of internet companies to, to be created and flourish. Like that happened unintentionally because they tried to regulate AT&T for something else. IBM in the eighties was a monopoly on all computer hardware and the government went to antitrust uh, regulate that. They wanted to stop them from basically having all this market. Now this lawsuit was not successful, but because IBM was so scared of antitrust, they unbundled hardware and software. Basically, you wouldn't get all their software automatically included with, with, with when you buy IBM hardware. And this allowed other software companies to get created, like Microsoft 
and Apple, who at the time were starting personal computing companies. Like these companies would not exist if IBM could have crushed them before. So that's that was the benefit. But then Microsoft and Apple got fucking huge. <laughs> so in the 90s, there was antitrust against Microsoft. Bill Gates was brought in front of the government. There was a huge antitrust lawsuit and they were trying to break up Microsoft. Now that was also not successful, but because of the lawsuit, Microsoft was scared. All right, they had to pull back on some of their most egregious competitive things. So when a, a young upstart company called Google showed up, they didn't crush them by using their 95% market share with Internet Explorer to make their only uh, search uh, default. And now we are seeing what happens when it goes back and they sue Google. And so what I'm saying is you might think Google is great right now, but as we have noticed in the past few years, search quality has not been improved. It's been stagnant for a very long time. People now search for their topic plus Reddit, or they use TikTok to search because Google search quality has been stagnant because they have no reason to improve. And if we put a little bit of threat on them through the power of antitrust to break up a monopoly, generally what happens is it creates a ton of new innovation. We're in an era where things like AI search are coming down the pike and giving all of control of that to the dominant player, Google, is probably not going to be as good as allowing new competitors to thrive. So in my mind, I think in general, no matter what your like feelings on Google products is, they're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and supporting antitrust has generally proved good for consumers in the past. Now, the second thing that happened in this trial is that I want to give a fail to Bing because they just got shit on. <laughs> Pretty much the whole defense from Google, like the government would say a bunch of stuff about, uh, you know, spending $10 billion, whatever. And then Google would just say, Bing fucking sucks. <laughs> And I mean, they're right, but that's not really the point. <laughs> they're trying to do kind of what Activision Blizzard did. Google's trying to make it all about Bing and Bing's failures and saying like, well, you know what? If they competed, that'd be fine, but it's not our fault they suck. Anyway, uh, that's my thing. I wanna go a different direction here and talk about something that I found out that is pretty new. And I wanna give a huge win here to Silicon Valley, okay? I don't wanna seem like I'm shitting on Google and Silicon Valley. I wanna give them a big win because I don't know if you guys know about payday loans. But payday loans are yuck. They're old. They're a concept of somebody doesn't get their paycheck for two weeks. They need money now for an emergency. So they take out a payday loan and then they get charged insane interest and basically leads to a cycle of debt. But now I want to give a big win to something way cooler that Silicon Valley came up with, something totally different. And that is called wage access apps. Earned wage access from companies like Earn In uh, that allow you to get paid the minute you leave work. This is about people who have to pay to get their paychecks early, which sounds a lot like a payday loan, but it's definitely not. I have found this new app called Earn In and others like it have been blowing up. So this stops at 2020, but the, the real number is now like 16 billion for 2023. And basically what it is, is it's an app that you plug in your hours and where you work and what you make, and it allows you to draw on your cash early and basically cash out. And that sounds fine, except for two things. One, they, they ask for a, d a tip, but it's a deep default tip equal to 10% of the cash advance. So if you want to get like a hundred bucks early, they'll take $10. But also is that if you want the money right now, which of course you do, nobody would use this money or they use this app to get it like in a day. If they want it right now, they also charge a $3.99 lightning fee. <laughs> So, you know, it sounds like a small amount, but getting charged something like $14 to take out a hundred is, is, is insane. It's a, it's rebranded payday loans that are preying on people's inability to make certain payments before the, the two week paycheck comes in, even though they advertise as no cost, no fee. And if you're nickel and diming hundreds of thousands of people consistently, it's a good business for you, but kind of shitty for them. Uh, and if you look at the math, they'd be better off putting it on a credit card because a credit card average APR interest is 20%, but the average for <laughs> earned wage access average that request tips is 334%. And the one without tips is 331%. It's just it's just a tiny percent better than payday loans, but with an entirely different rebrand and it seems clean and cool because it's on an app and people are, are falling for it. You know, when dollar signs appear, other companies try to muscle in. And the next phase of this has been extra interesting to me. And that is that like companies are now starting to create earned wage access apps for their own employees. For example, Uber now added this to their drivers where you can get paid early on money you've earned driving driving up to five times daily, but they charge you nearly a dollar per cash out. Why? You've already earned it. Bro, if you drive and the money's been paid, you shouldn't have to wait for a paycheck. So basically they're just reducing wages. So where I found most insidious was Walmart, which has this app called Instapay. And again, Instapay allows you to say, I need a certain amount. It'll deduct it automatically from your paycheck, but you have to buy like the plus version to get it, which is $6. Like this is all a way to just pay their workers 
workers less <laughs> in general. What they found is that the two week pay period system that America's had for a very long time, that is not common globally, by the way, is very hard for the average worker to like bills don't apply in the same schedule as you get paid. So sometimes things come up and like you need the money early that you've already earned. Everyone is, is jumping up to give you that, but only with insane fees. But what's worse than that is that like, this isn't just a bonus for Walmart employees. They're actually buying the app. <laughs> I saw this uh, headline, Walmart's FinTech arm acquires two firms in financial services, super app quest, which is a horrible headline. <laughs> Why does Walmart have a fintech arm, bro? <laughs> so they have, they've acquired more of these apps to try and build some kind of super app for their employees where all of their banking and financial services can be done through their employer who is gonna take fees every step of the way. Yeah, my, my overall concern here is that these wage access apps are just scammy. But you know, I think a lot of you in the chat have a similar reaction, which is kind of like, fuck these guys. Well, I don't think you're the only ones in the world feeling that because our next topic and our next win of this month or this week i'm sorry there was a pretty massive strike a few days ago does anyone know what it was anyone does anyone have any idea what industry you're all wrong. It was Corsair controllers. Corsair controller factories just had a massive strike because they are sick of making these $250 controllers piece by piece by hand and getting paid pennies. We're not asking to bankrupt the company. We just want a little piece of the pie. So when we go home, we can pay for groceries and we can pay for our kids to go to after school. I think that's pretty fair to ask. And I think a lot of people are asking the same question as costs rise for housing, food, rent, etc. People are asking like how they can afford to keep up. And then they're finally organizing into some kind of labor movement to get the wage increases that we haven't had since the 70s. So they did. So the Corsair workers have been doing that. That, that was kind of a joke though, because the real strike, of course, has been from the United Auto Workers, which is one of the biggest strikes in like 20 years. Since 2001, and before that, since like the 80s, we haven't had a strike this big, all right? The United Auto Workers have all joined on a strike against the big three. Unprecedented strike against all three bigger automakers. This is Ford, GM, and Stellantis, which make all of the brands you see here. Huge part of the domestic car market, combining to, I don't know, over a third, 13.4, 16, and 12%. And there's a strike from their from their workers. For the first time in our history, we will strike all three of the big three at once. And if we need to go all out, we will. Big speech from John Fain, head of the UAW. So I wanted to see what the CEOs had to say in response. We had a little super cut prepared. But I will tell you that we have put on the table increases, double digit increases that we've never seen before. 20 plus percent. If you include COLA, it's even larger than but that. But that's not 40 what they're Right, and for. I'm saying 40% will put us out of business. We would lose $15 billion. We would have to plant, sh cut, uh, cut people, close plants. What's the good of that? You heard the CEO of Ford say that it would bankrupt them if they met your demands. What do you think of that? I think it's a joke. You know what? They could double our pay right now. Labor, the cost of labor the co that goes into a vehicle is 5% of the vehicle. They could double our wages and they could not raise the price of vehicles. And they would still make billions of dollars. It's a lie like everything else that comes out of their mouth. Jim, make sure everyone's taken care of, but make sure everyone has a future. Uh, those words ring in my ears every night I go to sleep. <laughs> it would take um, just somebody like me 40 hours a week, um, no overtime, 365 years to make what our CEO made at Stellantis. I just now, after eight years in August, I just now reached top pay, yeah. and I just now started making, I think, a dollar more than what my mom made when she retired. In, 19 in 1997. You're getting a 34% pay increase over. First of all, thankfully, prices have not gone up since 1997. We can all agree that prices of everything, healthcare, food, cars, are the same as they were in 1997. So a dollar more is pretty damn good. Now, thankfully, I'm sure their pay is also staying stagnant. Percent pay increase over four years and you're offering 20% to employees right now. Do you think that's fair? Well, I think when you look at the overall the overall structure and, and the fact that 92% is based on performance, and you look at uh, what we've been doing of sharing in the profitability when the company does well, I think uh, we've got a very compelling offer on the table, and that's the focus I have right now. So they're talking about Mary Barra, CEO of GM's pay package, which is a uh, 29 million pay package, which again is 360 times what her, her median employee makes. And her response is that most of that is stock. So I only get paid when the company does well. And I think for a lot of us, especially people who are maybe younger in my audience, I think this is kind of normal. Like things have always been this way. CEOs always just make an insanely amount more than the average employee. But that is not the case. It's a very, it's a relatively recent innovation in America, which is that like somewhere recently, all of the money in a company 
company started going to the very top management. And uh, I wanted to know, like, you know, is her pay tied to performance? Now, there are some CEOs who I think possibly, I'm not getting, I'm not, people get mad at me for this saying this, but I'm not actually, I'm not a socialist. You know what I'm saying? People get mad. I'm not. I got, I think some CEOs might even be underpaid, bro. I think Tim Cook, when he took over in 2011, Apple was 1346 a share. Now it's 177. Most of the growth in Apple has happened under Tim Cook. He's made some important decisions. There was a strike at Apple and they wanted to cut his pay. I'd be like, okay, maybe he's not the problem. Except for until I saw this. Until I saw him do that Mother Nature commercial. Okay, good. <laughs> And now I do think he's overpaid. But I looked at Mary Barra, and this is the stock of GM. So they went public at $34 a share, and 13 years later, it is... <laughs> <laughs> down a dollar completely flat so it doesn't seem like her 28 million dollar pay is tied to performance and in fact i wanted to find exactly when she became ceo she became ceo on january 10th 2014 when the stock was 40 so over nine years of her job as ceo the company has decreased in value she has done nothing of value for this company and yet demands higher and higher pay package they keep growing and she seems to think it's galling the workers are asking for 34 percent wage increases i have found this pattern play out across many companies you know uh, a great example is is unity unity is making absolutely dumb decisions to try and make money everyone knows that unity sucks but why are they losing money look into it and it's like they're spending hundreds of millions on executive compensation they're not paying they're actually laying off devs all of the money in these companies is kind of being milked out by senior management and it, it doesn't seem like they're worth the cost that is being paid and no one's seeming to point this out <laughs> and i don't think and i think most people would agree if you were to replace Mary Barra with like a competent manager from the factory floor as CEO that it would tank GM. I don't think it would. I think GM would do fine. I think it might even do better if they had a worker as CEO and it didn't cost, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars over five years. Again, as you can see here, since 1978, CEO used to be like 20 times the average worker and they were considered rich. The economy still worked. We were still in a capitalist society, but CEOs only made 20 times the average worker. And now it's a uh, thousand... 460% uh, higher than the average workers' compensation, which has stayed basically flat for 30 years as costs have gone up. Uh, and so that, that's a problem. I think that's a problem that, that again, uh, this summer and this past year, really. Uh, that being said, there is a bit of pushback, and I want to give... <laughs> I'm gonna give a win to this guy. His name is Tim Gurner. And I wanna give a win to just doubling down on being the villain, bro. Let's listen to what he had to say at the, at the Financial Review Property Summit. People decided they didn't really wanna work so much anymore through COVID mm. and that has had a massive issue on productivity. We need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump 40, 50% in my view. 40, 50%? To remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. There's been a systematic change where employees feel the employer is extremely lucky to have them um, as opposed to the other way around. It's a dynamic that has to change. We've got to kill that attitude. And we're seeing it. I think every employer now is seeing it. I mean, there is definitely massive layoffs going off. That is true. It's happening. Talking about it, but people are definitely laying people off and we're starting to see less arrogance in the Arrogance is a crazy that word. Continue, <laughs> that will cascade across. I mean, you think of that woman in the previous clip who's just talking about working there for 16 years and has a dollar more than her mother did when she retired. She's so arrogant, bro. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> But the reason I'm giving this guy a win for this absolutely cartoon villain level speech, this guy, Tim Gurner, is the guy in 2017 who I believe first said, stop buying avocado toast. <laughs> He's the guy. He's the avocado toast guy. I mean, this guy is a fucking legend. We got to get unemployment up and you got to stop buying avocado toast. These are the ways for average people to get back. Yes, I do believe his wealth came from his grandfather and he's got like $445 million, but he understands. He understands what it takes. Speaking of people that got wealth from their parents and understand what it takes, let's talk a little bit about Elon Musk because the real winner of these strikes, unfortunately, is Elon Musk as he has a non-union workforce. And that is no accident. <laughs> Elon Musk and Tesla have a non-union workforce and they're competing against uh, the Detroit Big Three who do have a union workforce. Uh, Elon Musk has done a lot of things to try and make sure unions never come to Tesla factories. Specifically, he was uh, cited by the Labor Review Board for this tweet where he said, nothing is stopping Tesla team at our car plant from voting union. Could do so tomorrow if they wanted. But why pay union dues and give up stock options for nothing? The idea is that like, you're basically saying, hey, you, you won't get your stock options <laughs> if you do unions. So this is considered a threat threat and they found it as a threat and they find them as a threat and also this thing about nothing is stopping tesla team from voting union 
in 2018 that may have been true but recently it did not seem true because when they tried to unionize at the giga factory they fired dozens of workers all of whom were associated with the union <laughs> it seems like i don't think he actually believes that they should be allowed to vote for the i mean he's been trying again and again to stop it and that's funny because again you'd think this situation with the uaw strike he would be on the side of the strikers because they are handicapping his competition but in fact he is more scared about the labor movement doing well and spreading tesla factories so he has been trying to handicap them ever possible including something as petty as revoking the paid blue check from the united auto workers <laughs> And then had to be, you know, after a report called him on, he had to take it back. Uh, and also he banned pro-union shirts in his uh, factories. I actually have no real problem with the current pay at Tesla. And I think they do something interesting, which other companies don't do, which they have stock options for regular factory worker employees, which is cool. But that being said, the only way that Tesla pay comes even close to UAW pay is as long as Tesla stock stays super high. Because <laughs> if Tesla stock ever dips, uh, Tesla pay is actually shockingly lower than UAW pay. So it's it's very, it's very precarious. And right now workers are fine with it because of the stock options being good. So interesting, interesting comes out of Tesla. But an economist named Paul Krugman, who's a famous economist that's been giving kind of pointless speeches and articles for the past 30 years. My entire life I've seen Paul Krugman articles, but he put out a tweet saying, inflation's over, an inflation update. In the past, I have focused on a measure that excludes lagging shelter and used cars with food and energy. So he made an inflation chart that, that <laughs> is consumer price index removing food energy shelter and used cars to show that it's down <laughs> inflation's over what a good chart bro as long as you take out those five things inflation is down to only two percent thank you paul Krugman, for letting me know i have nothing to get mad about i don't know why these workers are striking now i you know because i'm stupid i'm not as smart as paul Krugman. but i looked into it and i noticed that <laughs> the average monthly household expense in the united states is mostly housing transportation and food <laughs> three of the top five things. So I decided to learn from my, my genius and realize that like things are actually even better than Paul Krugman says based on my new Atrioc patented CPI chart, <laughs> which is called CPI X food, energy, shelter, used cars, water, sewage, education, phone, pet care, clothing, hygiene, insurance, entertainment, healthcare. Six stars sold. By this metric, inflation has not only been decreased, it's been completely defeated. We won, America. And I know, I know that today's uh, Marketing Monday has been, I wouldn't say cynical, but it's, you know, there's been more tough news lately. In funny news, you might have seen this today, the United States lost a jet. They just lost it. There was an F-35, a guy was flying over South Carolina, he ejected, and because it's a stealth jet, they couldn't find it. <laughs> And so, no joke, they went on Twitter and asked. They just said, hey, we can't find our jet, can you help? And so the memes came in on Twitter, they were pretty funny. Losing an F-35 because the pilot put it on autopilot before ejecting and then not being able to track it because it's too good of a stealth fighter is possibly the funniest fuck up in modern military history. There was a Craigslist offer, <laughs> for sale F-35 jet best offer Charleston. <laughs> But the best one was when the only man who's really up to the task got on the case, and that is Ranboo. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say Ranboo? Rainbolt, dude, I'm so, I'm so Minecraft pilled, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Rainbolt, I'm sorry, Rainbolt, who ratioed Joint Chief uh, Charleston by responding that he would be the one to find it. And then my estimation is that because it landed in South Carolina, the only person who can really find it is the mob boss of South Carolina. And that is of course, Mr. Beast, who probably has already found it and is gold plating it as we speak for an upcoming video. Now, the real question that I'm more concerned about, cause I think they actually did find it about an hour before stream. They found it as a pile of debris. I think the bigger question on what's missing the 10 years and 80% of the budget that has been spent on this fighter since 2013, which is when it was supposed to be done. It's a, sorry, it's a hundred million dollar jet, but that's not as big a deal as the 1.7 trillion that's been spent on it so far. They got nothing on China. Great question, great point. Speaking of China and speaking of jets, that brings us to our next segment. What's up Beijing? What's up Beijing? What is up in Beijing indeed? Turns out also military jets, specifically 103 of them that just flew over Taiwan less than 24 hours ago. A new high in activity that Taiwan is calling military harassment. Now, I actually do not have much more to say on this because at the end of the day, this has happened in some form or the other for years. 
but it does seem to be escalating. The numbers keep getting bigger. The rhetoric keeps getting more intense. We don't know any much more about it, but I really wanted to use this as a segue into a much more interesting story. Again, war, okay, kind of boring. What is more interesting than war? Live streaming. <laughs> I am much more interested in live streaming which I think is the topic of today's Was Up Beijing. You see, live streaming is a massive, massive industry in China. Uh, and mostly it is used for direct sales shopping. And then people who are really good at this, who are personable in the chat likes and uh, are good at selling, can make extraordinary fortunes. So $500 billion in goods was sold via live stream on apps like Douyin and uh, Quashao. I'm not sure how to say it. Again, as we've heard in previous Was Up Beijing's, youth unemployment in China is at all time highs. And so the number of people in China who are trying trying to try non-standard careers like live streaming is also at all time highs. So people are all trying to do it. And I found this very interesting clip that was hitting uh, LSF recently of Jake and Bake walking down one of these so-called live stream streets. She's mocking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this guy. Oh my God, you got three phones. <laughs> He's streaming on three different apps, same time, three phones, boys. Get on his level. This guy's streaming on three different apps. Again, each one of these apps, by the way, has bigger audience than Twitch. <laughs> China has been ahead of the live stream game for a while. I mean, a lot of the innovations they do in terms of shopping are all being shipped over here. And it's extremely popular about career choice. And I want to talk about, I mean, again, uh, students are more and more choosing to do it. And in fact, uh, this is a, a billboard advertising live stream shopping classes. But the story that was interesting this week was this guy, Lee Jiagi, also known as Austin Lee. And he is known as the Lipstick King because in one day he sold $150 million of lipstick. <laughs> So they called him the Lipstick King. He is the most successful live stream shopping salesperson in China. And he recently, he was trying to sell an eyebrow pencil. And this is the clip, okay? <laughs> so, uh, we'll go to a little bit. This guy makes 695,000 USD a day <laughs> and is getting mad at his audience for calling this $11 IRA pencil expensive. And says, sometimes it's because of yourself. Maybe your salary hasn't risen for years. Did you work hard enough? <laughs> Uh, caused a huge backlash. Uh, you, you had to go live and apologize the next day. I mean, the, the amount of comments was insane. He lost a couple million followers, which again, he still has millions more, but uh, on the top comment on his apology post was very interesting. It said, you're making money out of ordinary people. And now you turned around saying ordinary people are too poor. <laughs> if I earn $685,000 a day, my tears would be much more sincere than yours. <laughs> So anyway, I, it's just interesting because while a few in live streaming have become massively successful in China, it is sort of a chased dream by millions more who are trying to escape high youth unemployment and not too much success. Now, last part of this is I just found that was interesting was I've heard this guy's name before and I remember the different story that we had before we did was at Beijing. So I looked back and found it and it was the same guy. This is the guy that had a live stream that was like the day before the anniversary of Tiananmen Square and his assistant had, I, I, I truly believe this was not intentional he had a tank shaped ice cream <laughs> i thought this might be like some kind of base reference but it turns out as far as i could tell from that look into it like it was like a complete accident but because it could be considered a reference again this is like probably actually not even one it was like two or three days before he disappeared for three months <laughs> yeah like the second they did this the the broadcast cut off halfway through and then this live streamer who's the most famous in in the country disappeared for three months for showing this tank shaped dessert and what was hilarious about it is that most of his fans young mostly female fans had no idea about Tiananmen Square and only learned about it because they researched it because they wanted to figure out why he disappeared <laughs> So it's like a total backfire. He reappeared three months later, completely didn't mention anything about it and went back to work and he was fine. But it was interesting. And I just thought that was an interesting story about what's going on in China. And I do think that like, if you look at trends in American social media, we are behind what they are doing in China. And I think we are only in the early phases of like a, a wave of online shopping and also possibly rising youth unemployment. What that means is up to us in future episodes of What's Up Beijing? Because that is the end of today's Marketing Monday. Thank you for watching. Tune in every week for more marketing and business and geopolitics news. Mm. Signing off. Check it, check it. Hey.